Well, good evening to each and every one of you. What a joy it is to be able to come your way from the sanctuary here to Faith Baptist Church of Altoona, Pennsylvania, the United States of America, with another virtual church service. And uh, it's a very interesting thing these days because now on Sunday morning we've got people in the church and then in the evening we're completely back to virtual services. And uh, it's just a delight to be able to be gathered together and come your way. We did have a great service this morning. You know, this is the Memorial Day weekend, and we focused on the concept of, of uh, freedom. Uh, you see, those who have died in military activity did so to protect our freedoms. And uh, we need to be very, very careful simply because of the fact that there are those today who would love to take those freedoms from us. And uh, I've been thinking this past uh, week as it relates to our freedoms and how we should respond to what's going on in the world today. And it takes uh, three Ps and maybe a fourth P to do it. In fact, I'm uh, praying about putting together a Stand in the Gap Today program on it uh, this week. Uh, as we face our freedoms and the circumstances that are in the world around us today, we look at the, the pastor, the pulpit, the pew, and the politician. Now, doesn't that sound interesting? Uh, we've, we've got people in here laughing at that. Would you believe that? But think about that. And, and I'm talking about responsibilities to help maintain the uh, freedoms that we have. You've got the pastor who has the responsibility to preach the whole counsel of God. And that means a biblical worldview. The message that I delivered this morning on the concept of freedom is grounded in what does the Bible say about freedom. Our Constitution, the United States Constitution, our Declaration of Independence is founded upon and grounded in biblical truth. And so preachers must preach the Word of God. The pulpit is designed to be the sacred desk through which the Word of God is preached. The pew, talking about the people in the pew, not the wooden pew that's sitting there. It doesn't have much to do but try to keep you comfortable. But the, the people in the pew then have the responsibility to carry out the message that the pastor delivers, the pastor preaches over the pulpit to the people in the pew. Look at all these P's. Pastor preaches over, pastor preaches over the pulpit to the people in the pew. Then the people in the pew carry it to the politicians. And, and you know, I was talking to somebody who was in church today, this morning, and, and uh, they said, you know, we go to Harrisburg every time we can to stand up for what's true, for what's right. And that's good. And anytime you get the opportunity to, to pick up the phone and talk to a politician or to write them a letter or to go and do something, if you have the opportunity to do something when it relates to standing for biblical truth, do it. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. And in everything that we do, we must let our salt be salty and not lose its savor because Jesus says if the salt loses its savor, it's good for nothing but to be cast out. Cast out. Think about that. Anytime a Christian gives up their testimony from God's eyes, they just are good for nothing but to be cast out. And sometimes we give up our testimonies when we don't stand for truth. So think about that. Our freedoms have been given to us by God. He gave it to us through our early founders. And when you read back in history, you'll find over and over again how it was because of the preaching of the pastors that the people in the pew stood for truth and led those who were in the political realm to stand for truth in putting together a nation. I think that now, 240 years after the founding of this nation, it's important that we do that again. July the 4th is the 240th birthday of our nation. Do I have that correct? 1776 to 2020. Do I have that right? 244. Oh, I never was good at math. 
244. I knew that. I was just checking. But you know, as, as the 4th of July Independence Day comes along, let's uh, make a commitment that we will do what we can to the truth of the Word of God and to stand for the truth of God and to live the truth of God and to promote the truth of God by putting together the pastor, the pulpit, the pew, and the politician standing for truth so that we don't lose our freedoms. We, we had a blessed service today. If you did not get the opportunity to watch it, I would encourage you to go back in the archives here and watch it. I think it will be a blessing to you. And uh, we do want to remind you that we will continue to have our morning services. Uh, somebody asked when we're going to start the evening service again. We don't really know. A number of the churches that were part of that 14 that started their service last Sunday, we had, a, we had a meeting again this past Thursday. And a number of the churches are starting their evening service next uh, Sunday night, the 7th of June. And about the best thing I can tell you is stay tuned. But we're here tonight, and we are delighted to have you wherever you may be. Thank you for the pleasure of your company. And I'd invite you to invite others to come on out and to uh, listen. I mean, when I say, mean, come on out, turn on their computer, turn on their telephone, however it is that they are watching. Invite them to do so, because we've got a good service tonight, I think. We are going to be doing some singing. We're going to be hearing a mission update. And uh, I'm going to be going back into our uh, series on 1 John. 1 John. I'm enjoying that series. We're just going down through it verse by verse. And the Lord will, will continue it for a while as God directs. And so just stay by your device that you have on and uh, participate. Get your Bible open to 1 John and be ready. But let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, as we come to you this evening, we do thank you and praise you for the God that you are. We do pray that we as Christians would stand for biblical truth because we live out the biblical world view. And help us always to look at all things through the eyes of your word. Now, Lord, we just commit this service tonight into your hands. Thank you for those who are watching. And I pray, dear Lord, that you will take the service and use it for your intended purpose to the eye single to your glory. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mr. Mike. We'll continue our service this evening by singing a great hymn entitled, Trusting Jesus, Trusting as the Moments Fly, Trusting as the Days Go By, Trusting Jesus, Whate'er Befall, Trusting Jesus, That Is All. Trusting Jesus, That Is All. Let's sing the first, second, and last verse, hymn number 449. Sing, we trust. Second verse now. Brightly
verse. Trust me. be seated. I actually remain standing uh, for as we read God's word here tonight. We're going to read from 1 Peter chapter 6 uh, verses 1 through 21. And so open your Bibles if you could and follow along on the screen as I read 1 Peter 6 verses 1 through 21. And the word of God says, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed, and that they have believing masters. Let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to goodliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strife of words, whereof come cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, who no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Thank you very much for the reading of God's word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this passage. Lord, I thank you how we can even learn from this ourselves. And Lord, learn to look at you. Uh, It talks about money, and it talks about the love of money and and riches here, Lord, but uh, we know that everything that we have comes from you, so really anything that we have is is not ours. It's it's been given to us, and Lord, we shouldn't focus on that, but we should focus more on you, who you are and how you provide us with the many different blessings that you give us. Lord, I pray that we would keep our eyes focused on you. I pray that we would uh, keep focused on you each and every day, and strive to, as it even mentions here, be, be righteous, 
Be what you want us to be and follow after you. And be holy because you are holy. Lord, I pray that you would help us to do that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Remain standing as we sing. Next hymn we'll be singing is The Solid Rock on Christ I Sand, All Other Ground is Sinking Sand. Number 28, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And let's sing it out as Brother Mark comes and leads us to All right, sing it out now. Pastor Chaz with our missions moment. Thank you, Mike. Our missionaries of the week this week are David and Catherine Tremel with Jeremiah, Noah, Bella, Sarah, and Emma. And of course, they're serving with Christian Servicemen's Center of America. They're down in Fort Bragg. And of course, they are the ones that we partner with and take the gifts to uh, for the Christmas gifts and uh, have some praise items here. Well, one praise item. And uh, it is actually concluded now, but they're done. Uh, the school ended this past Friday, and so they have a big praise there. As, uh, as the kids have had to been at, been at home for the last two months studying school. And so uh, praise the Lord that school's done there. I know uh, mostly schools are done here too. I guess there's some that are continuing, but uh, uh, they praise God that school's done. The prayer requests here, I think it's, it's, it's interesting, a couple of these prayer requests here. Uh, of course, today was their first church service back in the building, and so we do thank God that they were able to do that. We know what that's like. We had that last week, and so uh, it is an encouraging thing and an exciting thing. But the second one here, uh, I, I, I saw it on Wednesday, and I keep thinking about it. Uh, pray for our soldiers as they've been locked down and confined to their room during this pandemic. Uh, you know, I, you just you can't imagine what that would be. I can't imagine what that would be like. Uh, but they're locked down and confined to their room, and I don't know exactly what that means. Um, uh, but we do need to be praying for them. That can't be easy. And so be praying for the soldiers. Uh, the third one here, we've, we've seen this a couple with a couple different missionaries. I uh, pray that we can reschedule our meetings that were canceled. Uh, you know, lots, well, most churches in the United States, I don't know about every church, but most churches in the United States closed down their services. And uh, it affected missionaries as they weren't allowed or not able to go out and, 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 and raise support or see their, uh, their supporters or anything like that. And so uh, we do need to pray that they would be able to uh, reschedule their meetings. 
uh, and that they would be able to, to get out to these churches. And maybe some of these churches were going to support them. Uh, maybe they were already supporting churches, but they still need to get there and do that. Then, of course, uh, the last one, pray for our Bible study on Fort Bragg to start up again soon. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you uh, for the Tremels, and we thank you for uh, their work down in Fort Bragg. And Lord, uh, they're rejoicing, I'm thinking, today, uh, not just because school got out on Friday. That's, that was one reason to rejoice, but I think they're probably rejoicing again today, too, because they were able to uh, meet as a local body of believers and see fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. I do pray that everything went well down there. Lord, I do pray that you would be with uh, the soldiers uh, how they've been confined to their rooms. And, Lord, even as we uh, look at this other, uh, the Bible study hasn't been happening either. And so, Lord, I just pray that soon uh, they're able to get out of their rooms and that they're able to start this Bible study, get it going again, get back to studying God's Word. Lord, I do pray that these soldiers, as they are, have been confined in their rooms, have been reading their Bible, uh, have been uh, drawing closer to you as you would draw closer to them, Lord. I pray that you would continue to work in their lives. Lord, I do also pray that you would be uh, with the trembles as they need to reschedule many meetings, not just reschedule, but also schedule. And so, Lord, uh, be with them as they plan, uh, start planning things as churches are now starting to open up. And, Lord, as, as that happens, they can get traveling around again and, and get into the many different churches. But, Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless this ministry. Lord, uh, you never know as a soldier when you're going to be called to give your life. And Lord, I just uh, I pray that they are able to reach the many soldiers there at Fort Bragg uh, for Christ's sake, that many would come to know Christ as Savior, and that we would be able to see even a, a revival or a, uh, just a, a great salvation coming out of, out of the army, out of Fort Bragg. It would be awesome to see something like that and then trickle down to... Uh, the rest of us civilians. Lord, be working with that ministry there, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to sing along once again a hymn entitled, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, standing together as we sing. Let's take our hymnals and turn to hymn number 189. Number 189, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Let's sing it out all together now. 189. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. See, we're going to invite Joy Schultz back to the podium to share with us a special number at this time. Joy.
God's children said, ah, some of you were able to say amen, weren't you? And all God's children said, amen. amen. Yeah, praise the Lord and amen. How we can thank the Lord. Think of that. If he watches the little sparrow, then he's going to watch us. Why should we worry? Why should we fret? Why should we fear? His eyes on the sparrow. If he takes care of the sparrow and takes care of the grass of the field that, that we cut down and burn, and he sees that the flowers have nice little posies on them, why should we worry? And you know, it's just our perspective, isn't it? And as I shared uh, a little bit ago, when you talk about the biblical worldview and come to the point where you look at everything through the eyes of the scripture. It changes everything that we say, everything that we think, everything that we do. There is no doubt about that. And uh, I've been praying over the recent uh, months, actually, about delivering a series of messages uh, that relate to the biblical worldview. I, I preached on that uh, four or five or six years ago. And uh, actually, then we taught it in a 
an adult class in daily vacation Bible school. And I've got the notes on that. But um, I'm thinking that maybe one of these days again, we need to study it. Uh, because it's easy, isn't it? We are in this flesh. We are here. And, uh, you know, the Bible teaches us that our enemy is threefold. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Or as my boys used to say when they were little, the devil. The devil. By the way, my twins, our twins, turned 45 yesterday. One of which is Mike. Chaz is not the other one. He's 18, 15 months younger. But Mike and Tom turned... Uh, remember what I was telling you about the world, the flesh, and the devil. Because I have a story to tell before I go on. You know, back in the day that, that uh, the twins were born, they couldn't... Uh, they didn't have all this... Sauna, uh, not sauna, sonar. Is that the right word? Ultrasound, ultrasound to see what was inside the womb. And uh, I can remember that uh, Nancy went to the doctors for her eight month checkup. And the doctor said, Boy, I think you've got a big baby in there. And uh, so we said, Well, could it be twins? Because there's a lot of twins in our family. I, if I have it right, you go back um, eight generations. And we've got something like 20 sets of twins in our family on both sides. And so, uh, and it skips a generation. <laughs> Meredith? Uh, <laughs> you're the one. And, uh, but anyway, so we asked the question. We said, um, uh, could it be twins? The doctor said, no, no, no. I only hear one heartbeat. Later on that same day, Later on that same day, remember, I'm talking about the eighth month checkup. Later on that same day, Nancy says, I think it's time. And so we went to the, to the hospital, and, um, uh, you know, uh, Nancy was struggling a little bit. And, of course, they wouldn't let the, the husband in with the wife like they do today. And so they came out and said, we've got to take your wife downstairs to see what's going on. And so they took Nancy down, and when they brought her up a little bit later, the doctor said to Nancy, tell your husband what's going on. Nancy goes like this, two fingers up. Now remember, those are the days of President Nixon. Remember, he did that. And, and uh, I didn't think that, it was also the days of the hippies. Remember, the hippies did that. So you had President Nixon doing that, you had the hippies doing that, and I knew that she wasn't President Nixon and I knew she wasn't a hippie. I said, what do you mean? She says, there's two. Oh, we never knew that. Well, a little bit later, I heard some crying, and that was Tom. Seven minutes later, heard another set of tears dropping, and that was Mike. We didn't know Mike was coming. We had, we had a name for Tom. We had his nursery set up. We had a bed for him. We had the baby changing machine for him, or what are you, uh, uh, table, whatever you call it. What is it? You understand what I'm talking about? Uh, we had, we had his, his room all set up. And then Mike comes along and uh, changes the whole plan. Now, remember, we lived in Washington, D.C. in those days. So the next day, uh, Nancy's best friend, Lois, they grew up together in Massachusetts, um, went to Bible college together. <clears throat> so she was still around there, and we were still in that area. And uh, so uh, I said, Lois, you've got to help me. I said, we've got one set of bedroom things, and we've got two babies, and so we need to to do something, and I had a blue 1972 AMC Hornet. Remember them? Not very big. So we went out shopping for another set of items, and I don't remember if we got all of them at once or not, but I do remember that all those things were stuffed inside the car. Because of their size and shape, we couldn't get it in the trunk, that little trunk. So we stuffed all those things inside the car in Washington, D.C. Well, 
I said, Lois, can you drive? She said, yeah, but she says, where are you going to go? I went in the trunk. <laughs> That's how I started with you, in the trunk. Right? I went in the trunk, and we were in Washington, D.C., and had to go around the Beltway. Now, you know the Washington Beltway. And, and uh, I, so I was in that trunk going around the Beltway, and I left the trunk up a little bit so I could breathe. So, you know, people come up, I'd wave at them. There I am. <laughs> Going around the beltway in the trunk. Finally got things set up, but we didn't know what to name him. So for a couple of days in the hospital yet, that's when you stayed in the hospital a while after you have a baby. And uh, Tom was baby A and Mike was baby B. And so we ended up thinking, you better, we better give them names before. We had to name them before they left the hospital. So we started to rethink and uh, so we named uh, Tom after our, our fathers. Uh, Nancy's dad is Thomas Albert. So we named, and my dad's Gorman, so he's Thomas Gorman. And we named Mike after my grandparents. Mike is uh, my granddad, Hollahan, the pastor of Mike. And uh, his middle name is Lester which is my granddad doll. So there you got Michael Lester. And uh, uh, when they were little, Chaz couldn't say his name right. Chaz couldn't say Mike's name right. So he called him Mikey Lolly. So, you know, instead of Michael Lester, he called him Mikey Lolly. So every time you see Mike now, say, hi, Mikey Lolly. And uh, he'll know, he'll know what, you're, what you're talking about. Anyway, 45 years of age. Yesterday, these two were. And then later on, Chaz came along. I remember telling my grandmother when Nancy was pregnant with Chaz, and just 15 months later, you know, actually, I told her before 15 months, I remember my grandmother saying, Grandma, Grandmother Doll, she says, Gary, shame on you. I said, she, what, 15 months difference. Well, you know, Chaz was just like a triplet. And I remember the first day we brought him home from the hospital. We laid him on the floor, and Mike and Tom just crawled all over him, and goo, 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 all over him, you know. And that began that trek. And uh, here they are today, all three of them, in their mid-40s. And how we thank the Lord that they all three know the Lord, they love the Lord, they serve the Lord, they're involved with the ministry of the Lord. You can't beat that with a stick. And it started out on the Beltway in Washington, D.C. Anyway, getting back to the biblical worldview, and, you know, we could look at that from the biblical worldview, too, because the Bible says we're to be fruitful and multiply, right? That's where it begins. But anyway, um, it's important that we see everything through the eyes of the Scripture. And I'm seriously praying about the possibility of conducting another series on that because I think sometimes we get away from that. And particularly as we are facing COVID-19. What does the Bible say about COVID-19? About diseases and about the way to approach them and about the way to deal with them? It's not just a secular thing. It's not just a medical thing. It'll be done in history. Our children and grandchildren will remember the, these days. Uh, those of us who are older don't have much longer to remember them. <laughs> But the younger ones have some time to remember them. And they'll be saying to their children and grandchildren, I remember COVID-19. And they'll talk all about it. But what does the Bible say about things like COVID-19 and freedom? The Bible has something to say about everything. Everything. And uh, so we're going to take a look at uh, the Lord willing as he leads. We're going to study the biblical worldview one of these days before too long as, as the Lord leads. But now, Sunday mornings, we are going through the book of Philippians. We haven't been in there a couple of weeks because we had uh, Mother's Day. And then today we had a special service on freedom. And it was a beautiful service, wasn't it? Thank the Lord. We... We've gotten some responses on that service. Uh, Karen Knight uh, contacted me today and she said, you ought to preach that sermon at the Central Pennsylvania Bible Conference. I said, I don't think the boss would let me. <laughs> but that's me. 
But I don't think, I don't think that that's, I, maybe, we'll see what the Lord was. But that was a beautiful service, wasn't it? Praising the Lord, singing the patriotic hymns, saluting the flag, remembering those who gave their lives for our nation. It was a beautiful, beautiful service, I thought. And uh, we had a very good crowd out today as we socially distanced ourselves. And uh, I'm thankful unto the Lord that we had the opportunity to do it. So the Lord willing, next Sunday we'll get back in the book of Philippians. But then in the evening we've been going down through the book of First John. And tonight we're going to continue that. And I want us to focus briefly on First John chapter 1, as, excuse me, chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. And uh, I wouldn't mind for those of you who are here in the sanctuary to stand out of respect for God's word as I read and you follow along. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. Now, it seems like uh, over the past uh, weeks, every night, Sunday night, when we go down through 1 John, I encourage you to look for something that's in there that's repeated or count certain words or whatever the case. Tonight, I want to see if you can find a phrase that's repeated as I go down through these verses. 1 John chapter 3, chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. See if you can find a phrase that is repeated. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected, hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which ye had heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true and in you. Remember that word in, by the way. In you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. God always blesses the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to look into your word tonight. I pray that you'll teach it as you would have us to know it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, you may be seated, and as we read down through there, I, I suppose there are a couple of words repeated, but did you find any phrases that uh, were repeated in that particular passage? Anybody see a phrase that was repeated? No one? Anybody see any phrase that was repeated? Huh? The phrase, he that saith. You see that? The very beginning of verse 4. He that saith. You go down to verse 6. He that saith. You go down to verse 9. He that saith. Now those three, that one phrase mentioned three times, uh, really indicate the three divisions of this portion of scripture. And what we see in the first one, where it says there in verse 4, he that saith, that talks about the believer's obedience. When you get down to verse 6 and see the phrase, he that saith, that talks about the believer's walk. You drop down to verse 9 and you see that phrase, he that saith, it speaks of the believer's love. And so we're going to look at that. Now keep in mind, I've emphasized to you that in 1 John, we've got clear teaching on whether or not a person is saved. There are 38 marks of genuine salvation in 1 John. Uh, for a person to say, I don't know that I'm saved, number one, that perhaps means that they've never read 1 John. But secondly, it means that they don't have an understanding of, of God's Word. 
The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We know that. But when you compare your life to 1 John, you can see if you're saved or not. And these 38 things that are mentioned are not options. They're reality. They're truth. They're, they're black and white. They're not, they're not possibilities. They're right or wrong. Yes, no, black and white. If you have them, you're saved. If you don't, you're not. It's as simple as that. And so, you know, I would encourage you, um, if you're struggling with your salvation, read down through 1 John. And we have that little booklet on those 38 marks of salvation in 1 John. We do need to get it reproduced. I, I, we haven't done it yet, and uh, we will get it reproduced because I know a couple of you have asked for that since we've been studying this. But as we look at this passage of Scripture, we can see a couple of those marks. Now, uh, I do want to highlight those three points, but before we do that, look at verse 3. He says, and hereby we do know that we know him. You see how definite that is? You see how definite that is? He doesn't say, and hereby we think that we might have the possibility that we know him. Right? You see that? It says, hereby we do know that we know him. When? If we keep his commandments. See that? Now, go down to, uh, to verse 5. He says, But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know that we are in him. See that? No question about it. Hereby we know that we are in him. Now, uh, I don't want to confuse you because these things are entangled. But uh, this first point that we see in verses 4 and 5 talks about the believer's obedience. But when you drop back to verse 6, you see a phrase that's mentioned that is also uh, tied into this section and in some way relates to that which is in verse 5. I'm not confusing you yet, am I? Just stick with me. We'll try to explain this. Notice, verse 3, it says, And hereby we do know that we know him if we do what? Keep his commandments. You see that? Underline it. Then drop down, verse 5, But whosoever, or whoso, keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. And so we, we see two things here. We know that we are saved if we keep his commandments, and we know that we are saved if we keep his word. Now, some people may look at those two phrases and say that's the same thing. Not quite. Let me explain. First of all, it says, And hereby we do know that we know him, in verse 3, if we keep his commandments. What commandments is he talking about? The Ten Commandments? No. No, certainly it, it would involve that. But what commandments did the Lord Jesus Christ directly give? When you think of the Gospels, what are the two commandments that Jesus directly gave? The one was to love one another, right? You go back to the, the Gospel of John. You see that brought out very clearly. In fact, if you're, you're not sure about that, turn back to the Gospel of John chapter 15. And you can just, you can just mark it on your own. Go back to John chapter 15, and if you would please, look at verses 10 through 12. John chapter 15, verses 10 through 12. It says, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye... Uh, love one another as I have loved you. What is the commandment? To love one another. That's one of the commandments that the Lord Jesus gives us. And it's one of the indications of your salvation. If there's somebody you don't love but hate, you're not born again according to the word of God. I'll prove that in a bit. So if you're hovering hatred in your heart for somebody now, you better get on your knees and go to the Lord and make sure that you really know Christ. Hatred is not hatred for other people is not a mark of salvation. You might hate what they do, 
but you'll want to love them in the sense of sharing Christ with them and reaching out to help them, whatever the case, in, in the time of need. Go to the book of Galatians chapter, uh, chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2. Now you see, this is why 1 John is a great book on discipleship. Because it helps us to understand what Christianity is all about. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ, or the commandment of Christ. What is the law of Christ? To love one another. And loving one another means what? You help them bear their burden. If a person comes to you and has a burden to share, you don't just say, well, God bless you, have a happy day. You do what you can to help them with that burden, whatever that help would be. That's love. See, love isn't what you feel. Yeah, there's emotion to love. There's feeling to love. But love is action, isn't it? Illustrated by God. For God so loved the world that he really felt good about the world. Right? You know what it says? No. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Love is action. Love is giving. So the command of Christ to love one another means that we go out of our way to help people no matter what the condition is that they're in. Whatever sinful condition they're in, moral condition they're in, uh, spiritual condition they're in, financial condition they're in, personal, any condition that they're in, those of us who know the Lord will reach out to love them. Not hate them. We might not like what they've done. We might not like their character or characteristics, but we will reach out in the name of Christ to help them. So that's one of Christ's commandments. What's another one of his commandments? The Great Commission. Yeah. You know, Matthew, well, Matthew's one, but let's go back to the Gospel of Mark because the Gospel of Mark, I think, is one of the clearest presentations of the Great Commission, and I know that you know it. But let's just look at it again, right from the pages of Scripture. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, just before Jesus goes up into heaven, he says, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's, that's a command. We call it the Great Commission. But it's a command. And so, these are two things that Jesus commands us to do. To love others. And to preach the gospel, to go into all the world, be involved with missions and evangelism to every possible degree that we can. Now just look at those two things. He commands us to love one another, doesn't he? He commands us to go into all the world and preach the gospel, doesn't he? You go back to 1 John chapter 3. Why do I keep saying chapter 3? Somebody tell me. I don't know why. Just because I'm dull, I guess. You go back to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. It says, And hereby we do know that we know Him. Hereby do we know that we know Him. Hereby do we know that we know Him. Can you say that with me? Hereby we do know that we know Him. If we keep His commandments, which include what? Loving one another. And going into all the world of the gospel, being involved with missions and evangelism. If we don't love one another, if we're not involved with evangelism, we have every reason in the world to question our salvation. Now, beloved, don't question that. Don't don't even try to question that. Do you believe the Bible? Look what it says. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Is there any if in there, or any but, or any wiggle room in there? We know that we know him if we keep his commandments of loving one another and being involved with missions and evangelism. Think that through a little bit. Well, then he drops down in verse 5. He says, but whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we Uh, are in him we know that we are in him we know that 
uh, we know him if we keep his commandments, but we also know that we are in him if we keep his word. What's the difference between the commands of Christ and the word of Christ? The commands of Christ are part of Christ's words, right? But the word or the words of Christ are broader than the commands of Christ. For instance, when you read through the book of uh, Matthew, what do Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7 teach us? What do we normally call Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7? The what? The, well, the attitudes. The Sermon on the Mount. And uh, when, when you read down through there, um, you don't just see a bunch of commandments, but you see biblical principles, right? For instance, the Beatitudes were mentioned. Let's go back there. And they are the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the Beatitudes. Look at verse, five, verse 2. Of Matthew 5. I'm having a hard time with my numbers tonight. Good thing I don't play the lottery. I'd sure lose this evening. Matthew chapter 5 verse 2 says, And he opened his mouth and taught, taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you see a command there? No. You see a statement. Verse 4. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Do you see a command? No, you see a statement. And so when you read down through the Beatitudes and when you read down through the, the Sermon on the Mount, you may see some commands, but it's not three chapters of one command after another. But what we have there are biblical principles, divine principles by which to live. So, you see, we know that we belong to Christ if, number one, we keep His commands that are directly given to us. But also, if we do what we can do to keep the principles that may not necessarily be commandments that he gives to us in his teaching. In other words, the entire word of God is what we're looking at. It's interesting, he starts out uh, specific and then gets to the general, but nevertheless, that's the way that it is. The fact of the matter is, we know that we know the Lord when we look into this book and obey it. Now, we've already talked about the fact that every now and then every Christian is going to sin. We will do that. And that's what 1 John chapter 1 is all about. And that's why it says if we confess he's faithful just to forgive. And last uh, uh, time we talked about the fact that we've got a great teaching on hemardiology in this chapter. because it, And that's the study of sin. And, and uh, certainly we thank the Lord that if we sin, if we confess he's faithful and just to forgive. Yeah, we're going to sin. But here's the point. The person who's truly saved does not continue to live in sin. If a person claims that they're saved and they continue to habitually live in sin, well, God, uh, God will chasten them and ultimately means to take them home prematurely. You, 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 true believers don't continue to live in sin without confessing it. So, it's pretty clear. This isn't legalism. This is spiritual truth, that we know that we know him when we keep his commandments and when we keep his word. All right, let's look at these three points very briefly. First of all, we see the believer's obedience. Verses 4 and 5, it says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And whosoever keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected, hereby know we that we know him. I mean, the fact of the matter is that when we keep the word and the commandment of Christ, we know that we love him, but we know that we are saved. I don't know that we need to dig into that any deeper. It's pretty clear. If we say that, that we know him and don't keep his word, we are a liar. If we say that we know him and don't obey his commands, the truth is not in us. 
Who is the truth? Jesus Christ. Where does he live? In us, at the point of salvation. He takes up his residency in our life through the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's the marvelous thing about God. God is in us through the Holy Spirit. God's truth is in us through the Holy Spirit. Christ is in us, the hope of glory, the Bible says. But if we say that I know him and we keep not his commandments, the Bible says you're a liar. My grandmother, Nana, was a sweet, sweet person. The day that we had our memorial service, people stood up and gave testimonies, and Dad stood up and said, I know this isn't theologically correct, but I don't think Nana's ever sinned. <laughs> well, no, she did. Um, she probably did more than we imagine. But her testimony was a godly testimony, you see. She walked with God. And she was more theologically knowledgeable than what most of us believed. When she would say something profound, boy, it was profound. But she used to say, don't ever call anybody a liar. And she was being kind, gracious. But here the Bible calls people liars who say that they're saved. But don't obey the commands of God and don't obey the words of God. Pretty clear, isn't it? He that says I'm saved and I don't obey, mm -mm. Mm -mm. Are you with me on this? Are we going to stumble and fall and disobey from time to time? Are we? Yeah. But are we going to live in that sin? No. And that's the difference. As I brought up last week, the Christian should not expect to sin. Sin should be the exception rather than the rule in the life of the believer. But when it happens, what's the first thing we do? Go to the Lord and confess it. Agree with him that we've wronged him and he forgives. Praise God. Amen? Amen. All right. We see the, the believer's obedience. Secondly, we see the believer's walk. It says in verse uh, 6, it says, He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Let's try that again. He that saith, he abideth in him. That is, one who says I'm saved. Ought. That word ought is an interesting word. It means, carries along with it the idea of a moral obligation. A moral obligation. He that says he abides in him, in Christ, ought, that is, has a moral obligation, also so to walk even as he walked. Um, and he goes on, and notice what he says. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you. Did I, did I say earlier to remember that little word in? All right, remember it. Go on. Because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. You see, what John is saying is this. If you say that you're saved, then you've got a moral obligation to walk as he walked. Who's the he? Who's the he, class? Christ. Jesus Christ. So how does Christ walk? How does Christ walk? How did Christ walk on earth? What was it that, that, that really predominated his lifestyle? Well, there are numerous things we could really bring out. But keep your finger there in the book of 1 John and go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. You see how all this is tied together. John isn't just giving a number of words, phrases, separated from each other. But it's all tied together. Go back to Ephesians chapter 5 and look at verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, what's it say? As Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. 
Are you with me? Say amen. Those of you watching, are you with me? Say amen. Oh, I heard that. Anyway, I've said that I've been on television and on radio so much. I think I said this recently here, didn't I? That when I look into a camera or look into a microphone, I envision people. I don't, no, I, I don't see John and Bob and Bill and Sally and Sue and whoever. I, I, I sense the people's presence. I look in that camera. I don't see you, but I sense you. I talk into this mic. I don't see you, but I sense you. It's just something that grows with you. It's about being in radio and TV. You know, Hap Ritchie used to say, there are some people who are in radio and TV, and there are others where radio and TV is in them. What's the difference? If you're in radio and TV, you're just doing it. But when it's in you, you crave it. And I've craved television all of my life and radio. I always wanted to be in radio and TV. In fact, took some courses in the Columbia School of Broadcasting. I wanted to be a sportscaster. I wanted to be Vin Scully. Or, no, I wanted to be Bob, Bob uh, Prince. That shows you. Uh, I almost said Bob Walk, but I'm, I'm forgetting names tonight. Uh, Steve Blass. I, I, I love Steve Blass. And um, I'll tell you a little story about Steve Blass. We'll be done on time, don't worry. <laughs> Years ago, I took a busload of people out to the Pirate Baseball game. And... You know, if you know where to park out there, or if, well, wherever you park, they park the bus. But if you know where to go, you could see the players coming in. And they were playing Los Angeles Dodgers. Pirates were. And uh, wouldn't you just love to see a ball game? Wouldn't you like to see a baseball game? Amen, man, I tell you. I'm ready. Anyway... My Sunday night after church in the summertime is to go home and watch Sunday night baseball. Now I've got to go home and watch the news or whatever. Tonight I'm going to go home for a party. The doll clan's coming over to our house. That's why I know I will be done on time. Or I'll be in trouble. But I was standing there, standing there, whatever, watching the people go in. And here came Vin Scully. Remember Vin? the broadcaster for the Los Angeles Dodgers for years. He walked in there strutting along. A little guy, a little boy, six, seven, eight years old, was trying to get autographs. He went up to Mr. Scully and he said, he went to Vin Scully and said, Mr. Scully, would you sign your, autogra- sign your autograph for me? Vin pushed him away. Pushed him away. Pushed him away. Ooh. I almost tackled Ben Scully that day. I was angry. The Bible says, love your brother. Well, okay, I didn't beat him up. A little bit later, Steve Blass came walking in. Carrying, his hands were filled. They must have been going on a road trip afterwards because he had a garment bag, he had a suitcase, he had a briefcase, had all these things. He walked in. That same little boy was there. And he said, Mr. Blass, could I have your autograph? Steve laid down all those things, took that piece of paper, signed his autograph, picked up his things and went back in, shook the little boy's hand, whatever the case. You know, last year Steve Blass retired, and I called up the Pittsburgh Pirates, and then I also wrote that story, and I said, please give this to Steve. And um, uh, we were watching one, I think it was the last ball game that he broadcast. And he made a statement something like this. He says, one of the things that's always been a blessing to me in all these years of broadcasting baseball is being able to give my autograph to the little kids. I said to Nancy, I wonder if that's a reference to what I said about him. I don't know that it is. But when I was little, I wanted to be a sportscaster because TV and radio was in me. And so I've come to sense it. I sense people when I speak on radio or the television. So I'm sensing the presence of everybody who is watching tonight. And so I want you to understand that as I sense you, 
I appreciate the fact that you were there. And I'm here to tell you tonight that Jesus walked in love. He walked in love. And he loved us. And he gave himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. So, if we say we are in him, we have a moral obligation to walk as he walked. In what way? Loving others, being willing to give ourselves for others, not being selfish, not be saying me, myself, and I, but, but, but obeying and serving the Lord first and then reaching out to others in the name of the Lord. Love. Christ walked in love, gave himself for us, gave himself an offering for us, gave himself a sacrifice for us, died for us, and as Jesus did that for us, we are to be willing to do the same thing for others. Do you follow Jesus the way that he walks? You know, there are other things that we could look at tonight, but we won't, uh, that describe how Jesus walked. The word walk isn't necessarily in the various texts. But for instance, uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse, verses 9 and 10, Jesus said, I came to do your will, O God. That's obedience. Uh, that's submission to God's will, I should say. In John chapter 8, Jesus said that my meat is to do the will to, to, to obey him and do what he sent me to do. That's obedience. And then in Philippians chapter 2, we see that Jesus Christ, though he was in heaven for all of eternity past, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So we see there his submission to the Father, his obedience to the Father, his humility to go to the cross. And those are elements of Christ, the way that he lived. And so you see, if we are going to walk as Christ walked, specifically, yes, to love one another, to love God, but also to have that submission to God, that obedience to God, that humility of life, all of those are characteristics of Christ. And when we are saved, those characteristics will be evidence of our salvation. Maybe more in some people, maybe less in some people, but they'll be there. Well, let's go down to verse 7. He says, Brethren, I write no new. Now watch this. I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. What is the old commandment in this context? To what? Love one another. You can even trace that back into the Old Testament, can't you? But you can also trace it back to when Jesus began to preach. And I, I, as, as we stated before, that phrase, from the beginning, you see it there in verse 7. Uh, uh, he says, but an old commandment which he had from the beginning. You drop down to the last part of verse 7. It says, the old commandment uh, is the word which we have heard from the beginning. Remember a couple of weeks ago when we started our study in 1 John, I mentioned that that phrase, from the beginning, that you see back in verse 1, goes back to when Jesus began to teach. This doesn't go back to Genesis 1.1. This goes back to when Jesus began to teach. We, we, we substantiated that a couple of weeks ago. And so when he says, from the beginning, this command has been there. What is the command? Well, let's read it again. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment, which he had from the beginning. When, when Jesus began to preach, he talked about love. The old commandment is the word which he heard from the beginning to love one another. Jesus talked about that over and over again in the Gospels. Now he says, again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. What is the new commandment? To love one another. Are you with me on this? This is what he's talking about. He's talking about loving one another. Loving one another. What's the difference between the old command, which was taught from the time that Jesus began to preach, and the new command, if it's the same thing? We're talking about love. What's the difference? This is where somebody comes along and says there are contradictions in the Bible. Mm -mm. 
One of the most blessed things is when you think there's a contradiction and you study it through and you find it completes itself. All right, what little word have I told you to try to remember? The word what? In. What does it mean to be in? <laughs> Please, it means to be in. Well, look at it. Now follow this. The old commandment was to love one another. That old commandment is true and it is in him. And he showed it by going to the cross, didn't he? Didn't he? He showed it by going to the cross, right? All right. Then it says, and in you. You who? You who? In you. You as believers, right? In you. Who is in you? Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Here's the point. The old command was love one another and do that to the best of your ability. Are you with me? All right, are you with me? Love one another, Jesus said before the cross. Love one another before he went to the cross. And that was under the Old Testament dispensation of law. So you do your best to love one another. But now the command is new because it's in you through the Holy Spirit who what? Is in us. Right? And the new command basically is let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit in your life and do what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And one of the first things the Holy Spirit does in us is produce what? Love. Did you ever hear of the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is what's the first one? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Here's the point. John was saying before the Spirit of God was in you, you had to try to love on your own. And you failed at it. You might have tried, but most of the time you failed. But now it's in you through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Just yield to Him and you'll be loving people all over the place. Now we're not talking about mishy, mishy, mushy, washy. But what are we talking about? Going out of our way and bearing others' burdens. Are you with me? Are you with me? And so you see, you know that you're saved if indeed this love is manifested through you where no matter who the person is, you're willing to bear their burden, you're willing to forgive them even as Christ forgave you. Is it beginning to click? Is it beginning to click? Aren't you, don't you just love First John? Sure you do. You're just afraid to say so, aren't you? Sure you do. So what we see is the believer's, uh, the believer's obedience and the believer's walk. We are to walk as Christ walked, which means to love. And we've got the Spirit of Christ in us that enables us to love. Well, let me finish verse 8. It says, again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. What does it mean when it says the darkness is past? All things are passed away. All things become new. You see, before you were saved, you were living in darkness, but when you come to Christ, you're living in light. Before you were saved, you couldn't love everybody the way you should because you were, you know, you were just in the flesh. But now that you're in Christ, and now that Christ is in you, there's light. And that light is the ability to love others no matter what is the case. Going out of your way to help them to bear their burden no matter who they are, no matter what the case may be. Does that characterize you? See, one thing that characterizes the believer is obedience to God's to Christ's commands and his word. The other thing is love. Well, in verse 9, we see this concept of love brought out. I, I used the wrong word there. The first part is the believer's obedience. That's verses 4 and 5. The second part is the believer's walk in verse 6 through 8. That's walking as Christ walked in loving. But then in verse 9, through 11, we've got the believer's love, and this just sort of puts the capsule on it, where it says, He that saith, he is in the light, that is, is saved, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. Do you get that? 
If you say that you are in the light, that is, you're saved, and yet you hate others, you're in darkness. That means you're not yet saved. You see how clear this book is? Again, you might not like some things that other people do, but if you know the Lord, you're going to love them and help bear their burden. You're going to help them in their spiritual walk. Are you with me? I hope that you are. I hope I'm not being confusing to you tonight. These are characteristics that come out of those of us who know the Lord. It says, He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness. Even now, Beloved, if you have a spirit of hatred toward people, you ought to check your salvation. Because hatred for people does not live in born again people. Hatred for people does not live in born-again people. If this book is right, and I believe it is, then hatred for people doesn't live in born-again people. I'd hate what they do. I'd hate where they go. But we will do everything we can to lead them to Christ, won't we? We will do everything that we can to help them when they're down and out. We will do everything that we can to reach out to them in the name of Jesus. That's the difference. Verse 10, he says, he that loveth his brother abideth in light. One of the ways that you know that you're saved is by loving your brother. And there is none occasion of stumbling in him. You're not going to stumble and fall if you love others. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. My goodness, how much clearer do we need it to be? (laughs) I... uh, preached this passage of scripture when we were down in St. Petersburg. And I, I, I preached on it uh, just one, one, one Sunday morning and talked about the fact that, you know, we know that we love him if we keep his commandments. And I went down through this. I don't remember specifically what I said because this is a new outline. So I know that I didn't give this outline 25 years ago. But I remember standing at the door, and after I just said virtually what I've said to you tonight, you know that you are in the Lord if you keep his commandments, if you keep his word, if you love one another. I remember this lady, she, she had, uh, what is that, uh, um, back issues uh, when you're humped over, um, uh, Come on, I know it, I just can't say it. Huh? Say it loud. Scoliosis. She walked like this, and she had to look up to talk, and, and she walked like this and looked up to me, and she said, I said, hello, and I called her name. She says, I don't agree with you. Just like that. You know, she stooped over, I don't agree with you. Well, okay, what don't you agree with? She didn't agree with what I was saying, that if you're saved, you love others. If you're saved, you don't hate people. I said, ma'am, it's not me you've got to worry about. It's what does the Bible say. Seems like we're back to the biblical worldview, aren't we? What does the Bible say? And so we see John is elaborating upon salvation. We know that we're saved if obedience is the main part of our lifestyle. We know that we are saved if we walk as Christ walked in love and forgiving others. We know that we are saved if we love others and don't hate them. How much clearer do we need it to be? So let's always compare our life to the Word of God. Now, as I wrap this up, I trust I've not confused you. Because I know that this teaching can be just a little bit intricate. When we trust Jesus Christ as Savior, old things pass away, behold, all things become new, right? Does that mean that the sin nature is eradicated? No. It will never be eradicated until we see Jesus Christ. The sin nature being eradicated means we will never, ever sin. 
And there are a lot of people that believe that. And I don't know, but people who believe that aren't thinking too deeply because they know, don't they? That every now and then they say the wrong thing under their lips. Or maybe they say them outside their lips. They know every, they, they, if they're honest, they know they think the wrong things. Are you with me on that? Be honest. Yeah, even the, the, the greatest Christian of all sins. Read Romans 7. The Apostle Paul said, that which I know to do, I, don't, I can't do it. He says, oh, wretched man that I am. He was struggling with something. We all struggle with sin. But here is the point that, that, that we need to get. And that is, sin is the exception rather than the rule in the life of the believer. Are you with me on that? We're going to stumble and fall into sin every day, but we won't stay there. We'll get up, confess, God forgives, and we don't go on. And, and, and er, we, when we go on. <laughs> and let me say this, because this is where the devil likes to get a lot of people. They stumble and fall into sin, and, and the devil says, God will never use you again. If God stopped using people who stumbled and fell into sin, we'd all be in big, bad shape tonight. Every one of us. But thank God for the fact that no matter what it is, we stumble and fall into, and we confess and repent of that, God forgives, and he continues to use us. Not making an excuse for sin, but thanking God for grace. Thanking God for mercy. Thanking God for forgiveness. So what characterizes your life? If you're a born-again believer, there will be obedience. There will be walking as Christ walks. And there will be loving one another. Now, I want to be finished on time. And we've got two minutes to go. So we're not going to close in singing tonight. We're going to close like we normally close a Sunday evening service. Let's stand for prayer and uh, thank those of you who are joining us by virtual church service, media ministries. We remind you that church will be open next Sunday morning at 1030. We invite you to be with us. And um, uh, if we're going to be having a Sunday evening service when we decide that, we'll let you know. But thank you very much for being with us tonight. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, as we come to you this evening, we thank you that we've been able to spend time in 1 John chapter 2. Thank you for the clarity of it. And I pray, Lord, that if there's anybody under the sound of my voice who is questioning their salvation, that tonight will be the time when once and for all they'll call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and be saved. Help us, Lord, not to make excuses. Now, that's just me. Well, yeah. But when we are saved by grace and in you and you and us, sin will be the exception rather than the rule. We will be obeying you. We will be walking as Christ walked. We will be loving one another as the word of God clearly teaches. And that's not legalism. That is the spirit of God working in us, making us what God wants us to be. And so, Father, I pray that you'll take this teaching and through your spirit apply it to our hearts. Now, Father, I pray that you'll dismiss us with your blessing. Guide us and direct us as we go our various ways. Use us this week for your glory. And we'll give you the honor and the glory and the praise for it. In Jesus' name I pray. And to all those of you who are joining us, remember, keep looking up. Jesus could come. That's why I say the best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. Good night.